Thank you. Up a bit. Can you hear me at the back? <laughs> thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank Joe Mulholland for inviting me along to give this paper this evening. As a journalist, I'm not used to standing up and giving talks like this. I'm used to writing, as uh, Donald says, and I was used to when I was in RTE synopsizing events like this into one minute, 30 seconds for the six o'clock news. And I can assure you, this is much harder. <laughs> Anyway, I have t entitled my talk, Putting the Patient First, because I believe that if you put the patient first, everything else flows from that. The Irish health system, as we know, is huge. It impacts on all our lives, whether we're rich or poor, old or young. More when we're old, I think, than are when we are young. It's very complex, and it's not working. Everybody in this country can tell a story of having a, uh, an interface with the health service, particularly in hospitals, and coming out badly out of it, feeling upset. Maybe they were cured, but it didn't work out right in a lot of cases. Yet we spend 14.2 billion euros last year alone and the HSC alone. Over 107,000 people work in the health service. It's a huge sector in our economy. We have everything from medical cards, big hospitals, small hospitals, high-tech equipment, incontinence pads, you name it, the health service provides it. And we worry about the health service in this country. We worry about it for a very good reason. We worry that we can't get a service when we need it, particularly if we haven't got the money for it. And we worry where all the money is going, what Charlie McCreevy called the black hole, and whether there's a better way of doing things. And we worry about what will happen to us when we get sick and we need a doctor and we need care. And health is always in the news, like the Roscommon Hospital story, for example, which has been going on now for a few weeks. It, that's a political story as well as a medical story. And then we have medical tragedies and we have mistakes and we have covers up, cover ups and we have financial stories about budgets and cutbacks. But I think that there is a general agreement now in this country, because we've been talking about reform a lot here at the McGill School for the last few days, that massive reform is needed and has begun, as Ruth says in the Programme for Government. It's very clear the government is committed to radical reform. And the Minister wants to introduce the system of universal health insurance over probably about 10 years, and that's very radical. And hopefully tonight we'll hear more details from the Minister about exactly how he's going to do that over the next time. And this discussion about reform in the health service is very welcome because I don't think we actually talk enough about what needs to be done. We talk a lot about what's wrong and what happened to us, but we don't get past that a lot of the time to analyse what mistakes we made and how we can do it better. And so I thought tonight I'd ask three questions. One, what is our health system for? What went wrong in the first reform round? Because you will remember, back in 2002, 2004, we abolished the health boards and we had implemented the HSE, and that was a pretty major reform, and a lot of mistakes were made, and I want to look at that and see what we can learn from that. And then I'll ask that question, how do you achieve real change? How do you achieve change when there are so many vested interests and it's such a complex system? So what is our health system for? Is it for the workers who work in it? to make their life easy? Is it a local employer? Is it there to make profits? Is it a self-sustaining bureaucracy? Or is it an empire for doctors on the up? Actually, it is all that and more. But what the health service is supposed to be is making us well and keeping us well. And I think we lose that. We lose that a lot of the time. We lose that message. We want to be kept well in an environment that's safe and appropriate. And it's like that famous phrase that Bill Clinton used. He said, look, guys, it's the economy stupid. Well, actually, it's the patients stupid. I mean, you know, James Riley is a doctor. You know, he knows about patients. And it's about, the health service should be about making people well and keeping people well. And the health service should be first and foremost about doing that in the right place at the right time. And we hear the phrase, the money following the patient. But in fact, the money at the moment is following the doctors, it's following the technology, and it's following the hospitals and the profits, and the major hospitals in this country in particular. And in most cases, the service isn't being designed for the user, 
but it's been designed for the providers and how they manage it. How else can you explain, as I heard just last Tuesday night, why an elderly woman with a broken wrist is told to come to an emergency department of a major hospital for surgery on that wrist at 7 a.m. the following morning. She comes in, after three hours she gets a trolley, and she's left there fasting for 12 hours and told nothing about what's happening. Luckily her son was with her. Luckily her son is a doctor, was well able to stand up and demand and get things done. But he was appalled because he works in Britain and he said, that's not happening in Britain anymore. But she was left there fasting all day, and no one telling her what was happening, no one telling her what was going on. And everyone in this room, I think, can come up with a similar story of how patients, particularly elderly patients, are left to wait until the system decides they are ready to treat them. Now, only a year ago, the report by the expert group on resource allocation and financing in the health sector, which was chaired by Professor Francis Ruan, it's a fine, big, thick report, it reminds us that a people-centered system, quote unquote, where the resources follow the user across different care settings is actually one of the four guiding principles of our official national health strategy, which was published in 2001 when the HSE was, was first announced. Right care in the right place at the right time. If the money now, I would argue, is really to follow the patient, it should be based primarily in the community, in small health centres, community hospitals, primary care clinics, GP clinics, and in services brought to people in their home, not having people coming to the hospital. People-centeredness is how the official health strategy of this country describes it. Now, when the money follows the patient, the money resides primarily in the community, not in major, very expensive, specialist what are called tertiary hospitals, like a lot of the major Dublin hospitals. And a lot of them are in Dublin, and that's a history that goes way back and is, in, is affecting everything we do in the health service even now. When the money follows the patient, the service will come to the people. But only in really serious cases would it be necessary for someone to attend a major hospital for serious surgery or treatment. Primary t care teams based in the community would treat chronic diseases, would do the x-rays, would do the pathology tests, and would run a comprehensive prevention program for patients to know, for patients that they know, have known through their lives, and know their families, and have followed them. Now, we actually need fewer hospitals. We need fewer beds. And we need the good specialist hospitals to do the work they're designed to do, and not to be doing Small things, like fixing broken wrists. That lady should not have had to sit in that hospital to fix a broken wrist. It should have been fixed locally for her. Now, that actually was the vision that Professor Brendan Drum had when he took over as HSE CEO back in 2004. And the story of the opposition he faced to try and do that and the difficulties he endured. Now, they're the real lessons to be learned in how difficult it can be to bring real change to a massive organization like the HSE and the Health Service. Which brings me to question two, what went wrong the first time and what lessons can be learned? Now, for their own reasons, mostly to do with forthcoming elections, the politicians in Fianna Fáil and the PDs decided to abolish the health boards practically overnight and put in the HSC back in 2002 and 2004, and they weren't actually ready for that. Now, they did have three expert reports in their desks to help them, but they had decided that the HSE was, or that the health boards, I should say, were to blame for inconsistent standards of service, too much politics in health, the black hole in the health services, and local rows about hospitals and services. Have the local rows about hospitals and services ended? I don't think so. They're still going on. The health boards are gone, but the rows have continued. Now, hindsight is a wonderful thing. And it wasn't long before it was clear that abandoning one system, they had failed to adequately prepare for a new one. And this is a lesson, I think, if we are moving to a very radical system, that we actually plan it, we prepare it. And we're not very good at planning in this country. I think there's lots of evidence of that. Now, others would say that by setting up a central executive, the huge changes to bringing the new groupings together were not thought through at all. And then Brendan Drum also had a further millstone around his neck. There was a last-minute deal done with the Impact Trade Union that nobody would lose their job or be moved against their will. In retrospect, Many commentators will look back and see what a major mistake that was. The result was a mess. 
hundreds of managers not knowing what they were doing, nobody knowing who to report to, few people making decisions except at the very top, and huge replication of management grades at all levels throughout the, throughout the health service. It was what one public health doctor I was talking to at the time described to me as like wading through mud, she said, to find out who to go to to put a signature on a form to enable her patient to receive treatment, or to find out what was going on, where meetings were being held, and who could make a decision that would impact and that she would be able to get some work done. And a vastly unwieldy bureaucracy, over-centralized and unaccountable, was created. While salaries rose as new grades were created to accommodate huge numbers of managers created in the new system, no wonder people got demoralized inside and outside the health service. Now, the health boards, yes, they needed to be abolished. But there was one thing the health boards did have, a lot of good local knowledge. And they did have local representatives who were close to the people. And for journalists even, local journalists writing for local papers, could find out what was happening with local services by going to a health board meeting, which was held in public. There are no meetings now held in public. There is no way to find out who's making decisions about what. Once every quarter, the CEO of the HSC and the Minister for Health appear before the Oireachtas Committee on Health, and they're asked questions by the me members of the Oireachtas Committee. Uh, that is available for people to watch as a webcast, but it's not anything like the, what should have been there to allow people to see accountability, thanks Joe, and transparency in how decisions were being made in the HSC. And I think that that was a huge... People are very, get very angry about the HSC. And when you talk to people in the HSC, they say, why are people so angry? And I think it is because they don't know who's running the HSC. They don't know who's making decisions, and they feel very cut off from that. Now... You could say, okay, that's just about administration, tough, it's difficult, it's working its way through now, there's going to be a redundancy package for managers. But it's important to remember what the impact of what happened, you know, had on people's lives. It was going to take a while to turn the ship around, that's how Brendan Drum would have said it. But it was people's lives who were at stake here, and that's why it's so important that we get it right for the health service. People are living and dying according to the health service. A good illustration of what this mess meant on the ground can be found in the report by John Fitzgerald into the HSE's mishandling of the misdiagnosis of women with breast cancer in Portlaoise Hospital in November 2007, which, as you know, was three years after the HSE was set up. John Fitzgerald was called in when it became clear that the HSE at regional level in Portlaoise, but also at national level, had mishandled not only the misdiagnosis of potential breast cancers, but also its own review into what went wrong. Fitzgerald found, and I quote, there were too many people involved from different levels and areas within the HSC without any clarity about their roles and responsibilities while in the process, unquote. He found the decision-making processes in the HSC fragmented, insufficient clarity about decisions, who was making them, what were being made, and when they were being signed off. There were what he described as systemic weaknesses of governance, management, and communication. Now, in this example in Port Leash, which is just one small example, it should be remembered that at least six women were told they had cancer when they didn't and received inappropriate uh, treatment as a result. Now, the system of breast, imaging, uh, breast cancer imaging in Port Leash was found to be deficient and below standard. Now, as you know, this was all around the time that the new cancer strategy was coming in. They have centralized cancer services uh, around centers of excellence. And in order to do that, it should be remembered, they had to ring fence the whole cancer directorate, give it a separate cancer uh, czar, so to speak, who came over from Canada, to actually implement the changes. And there was, as you know, huge opposition by a lot of hospitals at local level to losing what were substandard cancer services. And to be fair to the government, they did actually in the end do a good job of communicating why it was important that the cancer services be run in big centres of excellence. Now, Port Leash is just one example of misdiagnoses, mistakes and mishaps over the last few years. And I think that the creation of the unwieldy system of the HSC has meant confusion and great difficulties for people working in the system who are trying to bring change, because they've militated against initiative and against innovation, and the patient has been, and the public, the taxpayer, has been the loser. Now, Professor Drum will tell you, when he arrived in the HSC, he literally had to start from scratch with a desk and a chair, 
But by the time he had arrived, though, separate pillars had been set up. A pillar for hospitals, like a silo, so to speak, um, for, for community care, and then for, for shared services. And nobody in hospitals could talk across to community. You had to refer upwards for hospitals to the top, you had to refer upwards for community care at the top, and then try and work back down again. Which, it, all local autonomy was taken away and centralised, and nobody was allowed to make a decision without referring it upwards. Now, Professor Brendan Drum was hamstrung with the system he had, and he has changed it, he has started the integration of the services, but it was unwieldy, and I think that could have been avoided with more forward planning and more thought before that jumping in to abolish the health boards. And he, the other thing that hamstrung Professor Brendan Drum was the lack of data about the hospitals working and how the services were working and how efficient they were. And I know certainly Charlie McCreevy at the time and the government at the time we were very frustrated about the fact that there was this black hole of health. They kept putting more and more, more, more money into health, and yet it didn't seem to be getting any better. The waiting lists were getting longer. Now, he set out five priorities, Professor Drum. Hospital reconfiguration. We know where that's going. Primary care. Integration of care. And clinical leadership and performance measurement. He called that his transformation agenda. We're talking about transformation now, but this was him trying to do his transformation agenda um, since 2005. Now, he left last year, and on balance, he did achieve quite a lot. You have to give him credit for some things and his team. He put clinical leadership, leadership systems in place in the hospitals. They're not perfect, but there is a big improvement in doctors being involved in clinical leadership in hospitals. There's the beginning of greater integration of care. The pillars have been replaced with national directorates, and there are now regional managers. So a little bit of, manage, of the decision-making has come down a bit to the regions. Hospital reconfiguration has begun. Now, as we know, looking at Roscommon, there's a lot of opposition. And I think there's a real reason why there's opposition. It's because there is fear that promises being made about ambulance services being improved and local staffing being improved, those promises are not being kept. I mean, there's an example in Sligo where the breast cancer surgery services were removed and moved to Galway. People were told in Sligo there would be dedicated, protected beds for them in Galway. That hasn't turned out to be the case for a lot of patients coming down to Galway. And people are rightly angry about that. Now, performance measurement has improved as well. The health stat system, which is available for people to look at, see how hospitals are doing, what the waiting lists are doing, how particular areas are doing, that's all there. Absenteeism rates, all the kind of information is now being collected, and it's now up on websites for people to see. You can go find it in the hse.ie. There's still no similar system for community-based services, and that's nearly one-third of the budget. So, I mean, that's still a long way to go. And the primary care teams are a long way off. We are optimistic now that this minister who is a GP himself, was a GP, that he will actually promote primary care. Because if you get primary care right, the rest should come in. And there is a national authority. There's national financial control. There are better controls, and that's good. And there's also a national standards authority called HICWA. We hear a lot about HICWA in nursing homes recently. Well, that is an independent national standards authority, and that's a real shining light in the, in the reforms that have taken place. I think that really will show that was very well worth doing. But it should be remembered that just a few months ago, when the, when the HSE annual report came out for 2010, that Cahill McGee, the new CEO, said his financial and service data is still having to be manually implemented, and it's not fit for purpose, and it still hasn't been done. So, finally, how do you achieve real change? Now, this is where I'm trying to be a bit optimistic. We, there are a lot of, there's a lot of opposition to change. Change is very difficult, particularly in, a, in an organization as big and unwieldy as the HSC. And the service is structured, as I said, to suit the people who work in it, I think, not the patients. But, to, in my opinion, there is innovation. But it's the, the real innovators and the main advocates of change are often, are often in the voluntary sector and outside the actual HSC. Now, as you know, outside agencies are a huge part of the health service, and they receive 3.6 billion a year last year alone from the HSC to run services like, as you know, mental handicap, and a lot of those services are being run uh, outside the HSC itself. Now, the hospital sector is very dominant, and primary care remains the poor relation. So how do you achieve real change? Well, I think if you put the patient first, this is how you do it. Change is occurring. I mean, just want to give one example of something that was told about recently. And, you know, it makes you, you think that this, there really is a way of, of, of working this through. The Hospice Foundation 
Uh, the Irish Hospice Foundation, as you know, funds and runs quite a lot of hospices around the country, and they're a terrific organisation because they bring dignity and respect to the care of people dying at, the, at their end of life. And they wanted to introduce those principles, those hospice principles of respect and dignity around dying, into hospitals. You think, well, surely that's there already, but in fact, no. You know, 15,000 people every year die in acute hospitals in this country, and yet there was no... Uh, sign of, of, of anybody giving any kind of in attention to end of life care. So what the Hospice Foundation did was they set up a, a program called Hospice Friendly Hospitals and what they did was they created pathways in the, uh, in the hospitals to see the journey of a patient going through a hospital and then to see how that journey could be improved. And they did things like putting in quiet rooms, putting in symbols like candles and drapes to show the staff and other people that someone was dying or had died in the hospital. What we were having up to now was somebody could be dying in a six-bedded ward with the television blaring in the background and visitors chatting away to somebody in the next bed when just a little, little um, you know, curtain between them. Very, very difficult. Big innovation, for example, so practical, so obvious, you'd think it was small, was a thing called a belongings bag, because when people died in hospital up to a year ago, and you were handed the personal effects of your, of your, um, dead, of your, your family member, you were handed it in a black plastic bin bag. Now, it's hard to believe it, but people have literally been handed uh, clothes and personal effects. Now, they've changed all that to a new bag that people get. It's very nice. There's lovely dignity in that. seems small. That took three or four years to implement across the hospitals. It's, it's just one example. And what they did was they brought in champions for change. People in the hospital who want to change were brought together into a steering group to promote change in the hospital and to make improvements. I'm going to very quickly get to the end. They found people in the hospitals who were asking the hard questions to go to advocate for change and for the patient in the hospital. So I'll just go to quickly to the end. What the Hospice Foundation showed is that people are willing to change. Staff want to make things better. They want to make things better for patients, but sometimes they need someone to come in and show them how to do it. They need to do it at a really micro level. And when it can be done, it makes a difference to everybody. It makes a difference to patients, um, particularly, who are the people we should be worried about and taking care of first and foremost. So from very quickly to wrap up, innovation comes from voluntary organizations. They're small. Patients' representatives are really important. And yes, there are vested interests, but a lot of staff want to see change. They want to see things working better. And finally, as a broadcaster, I would argue communication. Communicating change is very important. Keep people on board. You need to tell them what you're doing all the time and you need to keep telling them. Thanks very much.